Doubt. Hello, everyone. I think everyone is now in. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on DOT, our distributed open transcription environment. Uh, we will be recording this uh, event, uh, but they are all uh, your names and uh, and images, they will be covered, so we will not be present in the video, uh, and we will uh, most likely upload the video to our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, but uh, this is a webinar uh, on DOT, and we hope that you will uh, uh, enjoy our demonstration of Dote, and that, that you can uh, you can please uh, ask questions uh, as we go along. So uh, there will be a brief introduction, and then we will have a live demonstration of Dote. Uh, then we can do a Q and A, and then we would also like to advertise our survey that we are running at the moment, uh, as we are preparing to develop uh, new software that will also support uh, qualitative work with uh, video and audio data. But please uh, use the, the chat if you have any questions as we uh, do our presentation. Um, today we are uh, Paul uh, McElwinney, who is also the designer and uh, has done a lot of documentation and video tutorials in relation to Dope. Uh, I am Jakob, uh, and we also have uh, our developer, Alex Stein, with us today. Uh, besides the three of us, uh, we also have uh, Jonas. Nermark, who's doing our UI and license uh, manager and our web shop. And then we also want to uh, thank uh, Arthur Babanesh, uh, Babanabash uh, Kovacs, who was the uh, lead developer in the first period when we did uh, Dote. Yes. So uh, just to spend a few seconds on the Dote universe, uh, we support and uh, give access to a free version uh, of Dote where you can have uh, try out Dote for free. There are some restrictions uh, that, that will not allow you to, to use the full uh, uh, possibilities in Dote. And then we have uh, Dote Pro and Dote Pro Community, which are paid versions of our software. Uh, we uh, recommend that you go to our web shop uh, on dote.aau.dk uh, and learn more about uh, the different uh, additions that we have uh, in terms of software. On Dote, we really recommend that you use, that you bookmark doteaau.dk because it's uh, like a, the main entrance to uh, the Dote universe. On the website, you will also find a, a link to our online help guide where you will uh, find uh, most of the things uh, that in relation to Dote that we have covered that. Uh, and you can see how you can deal with different issues, how to uh, import media, how to uh, use the editor, and so on and so on. So that's really a, a nice resource for uh, if you're looking for help. Then we also have a YouTube channel where we have uh, uploaded, I think, um, around 45 different tutorials uh, that will cover uh, all the initial steps of how to set up Dote, but also more advanced features, uh, how to use the search uh, uh, engine in Dote to uh, and use that and also cover more advanced features uh, in Dote. We also would like to invite you to our Discord server where we will uh, post announcements. Uh, you can chat with the developers uh, and engage in discussions with other uh, Dote users. And uh, then finally, we have our GitHub repository uh, where you can uh, post bugs. Uh, we will also post new fixes and releases uh, as we do, as we constantly develop Dote uh, and make it an even better product that can support your qualitative work with uh, audiovisual data. So uh, often we are asked, uh, why does Dote come with a price? Uh, and that is simply due to the fact that we are uh, currently uh, given a small budget from the university but we also want to see if we can actually develop a uh, an infrastructure that can support qualitative methods so we can continue developing our software and the question is whether we can find a sustainable uh, model for developing dote uh, so we can continue developing it in the future we don't know if we can keep 
getting the funding from the university. And that is also why we want to see if we can re really make this sustainable. It's also important for us to stress that uh, we don't get any hours out of uh, developing uh, DOTE and the income from, um, from creating DOTE. All of the money uh, goes into uh, hiring developers uh, so we can continue our development of uh, DOTE. So, so that is really why it, there is a price for the DOTE Pro and DOTE Pro community. Um, so uh, uh, please visit our website. Uh, our slogan is, uh, if you have seen our promo video, uh, make transcription fun again. And we really hope that, that DOTE will, uh, will make transcription fun again. If you are using DOTE in your research projects, then we would also be very happy if you would cite uh, DOTE. And the citation is also uh, uh, available on the website, but uh, it's also right here. So now we will uh, switch over to a live demonstration of uh, DOTE and I will uh, stop sharing and then Paul will take over. We, we have not a great amount of time, so we can't show all the features of DOTE, um, but we can give you some idea of some of the things it can do. And then if you want to see something very more specifically, then you can put that into the chat or into uh, ask it as a, a question when we get to the Q&A. Um, and uh, just to say that uh, Jakob and I are both researchers. Um, so we are, this, this software came out of our uh, long experience in doing transcription uh, within particular uh, methods or methodologies and uh, finding that the tools that are available uh, up to now uh, have, have uh, they can do certain things, but there was a lot of things missing that we felt we could develop better or add as new features. So what we're gonna try and do is today is show you some of those. And what you see here, uh, let me just, um, just get something. Oops. I'm just gonna get a better tool for showing you, which I hadn't already started. Here, you can now hopefully see I have a cursor. And when I click on a button or a you'll see a, a mouse appear showing you what button I'm pressing on the mouse. And down at the bottom here, when I press a key, for example, if I just press a key now, notice there it was starting a loop. Then uh, you can see down here, you'll see the key that's, that I'm pressing. So it gives you some idea about what's happening uh, or what I'm doing to get certain effects in the interface of this software. And this is a, a project that's already been assembled uh, so it's 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 rich. It's got uh, a certain uh, amount, uh, three minutes, 43 seconds of video. It's actually got two videos um, that are possible in this recording. And this is we can show you this and this is free to download from an archive because everybody present here agreed for this to be made public and it can be on YouTube and it can also be used for research if somebody wished. It's in Danish. Uh, and here we see a transcript using uh, the standard uh, Jeffersonian transcript conventions. Um, and then we have different parts of the interface that we'll try and show you. But the basic ways that DOTE works, uh, and, and it's meant to be it's, with the free model, the, for the free edition, it's meant to be that you could take some video recordings or audio recordings of, of an event and load them up into DOTE and then start transcribing and being able to play and synchronize playback of the transcript to the video or videos or audio files that you have. And it's one single strip of uh, an event. So it, all the media in one DOTE project, uh, we can see in the media manager, you'll see that there are several media files, only two of which are currently available in this transcript here because I'm showing you a free demo version. If you are the free version, you can't see all of these at the same time. You can in the paid version. Then you can see we can we have different media here, some 360 cameras, 2D cameras, and then an audio microphone here, which is a wireless mic. All of these are synced together so that they all start at the same point in the event and they all finish at the same point. And that's a basic principle of DOE. All the media you import in a project need to be synced before you bring them into DOE because there's software that does it a good job of that, whether it's Premiere or other software uh, uh, for video editing. And um, we don't want to reproduce that inside DOE. 
Um, and in fact, if we try to, maybe there would be problems and issues about that, which would cause more trouble. So, so our premise is that you have some data that you've already prepared and then everything is synced. So they all start at the same endpoint when the event starts and then they all go to the very end and that could be five minutes, it could be an hour, it could be three hours. Uh, there is, it really is no limit to the size. And if you have more than one video or audio, we probably recommend that you use a, an SSD drive, a solid state drive, not a normal hard disk, because otherwise it's going to be very hard to switch and play all of these at the same time. So you need to have quite a fast drive where you store them. And the basic principle of DOT is everything should be local. It could be on a, on a network drive, but having it on the cloud um, we don't support uh, uh, because it's often it's extremely slow. You can't play back media very well. It's also, if you have sensitive material, it's not encrypted. Uh, it's traveling over the internet. As, uh, it could be intercepted. So that could be an issue, um, especially under the GDPR in Europe. So uh, uh, we support that everything's stored locally somewhere or locally accessible from your computer. And that means it can be secure and safe as long, as long as you keep your, your drives and your computer safe. So that's the principles behind DOPE. You start off with some media, and that's representing some recording of an event in the world sometime in the past. And then you'll be able to make a transcript. And here you'll see we've already made a transcript here, and we can show you, you know, how we edit this. And then at the end, you end up being able to export it once you've saved it and You've done whatever you need. You can export to RTF. And if I just show you that, you see here is a preview of an export that's got no special formatting applied to it yet. And I'll show a bit later how to do that. But this is now exportable for RTF, which can be opened in Word, MS Word, or any other word processor. It's a standard format. And it will look identically to what your transcript looked like in Dope. And you can add nice formatting as well, which we'll show. So that's the idea. And in the free version, you can do that. You can import a video. You can transcribe it up to 200 lines, uh, more than 200 lines. Then that's the paid version. And then you can export it to RTF. So it looks pretty much like you want. But there are the extra special features of formatting are not available unless you have the paid version. So we use this with students, though it is free for our students in our university. But it's, uh, for if students weren't in our university, then they could use it to do basic transcription using Jefferson and uh, Jeffersonian conventions. And they could maybe try them on Dardian conventions, but they're not really a basic set of conventions uh, to use. They're more sophisticated and, and export that uh, and have that. And we have students doing projects for the last year who've been using this, hundreds of students, uh, to, to, with a workflow that allows them to take their videos of their choosing, make a transcript and export it, put it in their project to submit for, for their exam. But if you want the extra features, you want to have very long transcripts, you want to have nice formatting of your transcripts when they get exported, you want to have much better version control, as you'll see, and, uh, and you want to have uh, uh, some other small features that we put in the paid version, then you'll have to, to buy uh, the, the paid version, which is on the, you can do from the website, the web shop. So let's just say we had a new project. And if you want to make a new project, you can say new project. And it asks for a name. And it asks you for the transcript name, because every project can have multiple transcripts in. And uh, you can choose your conventions. We support these two. Some people request, well, what about GAT2 or Santa Barbara type or others? Well, we support these two because these two are, are very uh, standardized. And uh, ground darting is becoming much more well known. Uh, we could expand to others in a later point. And then you choose a place for it. And I have them stored on, a, on an external SSD drive, which I've, and I have them in a folder called My Dope Projects. So I've got several there. And I could create the project. Uh, so if I go to Open Project or Open Transcript, you'll see that I have them stored. I have bookmarks. I have, I could, they could be anywhere on all these different drives that I have on my computer. And I have recent ones I've opened. And then over here shows you all of them underneath this My Dope Projects. So it shows you the folders. And then underneath that, there might be multiple different transcripts in different projects. And you can see here, we've got some different variants of this Lego demo that I've just shown, but we have other ones 
of Mandata examples or Shegloff examples or Stensig examples, which we could show if we need to. So um, I'm going to cancel that. We will come back to show uh, one or two of these other ones here in a moment. Oh, and, and that, when you create a new one, it would be there in the list there with, an, with the project name and the transcript name that I just chosen. When I up here chose new project, whatever I've given here, they would now be in that list. And you don't have to store them all in the same place. They could be on different drives. I have transcripts all over the place uh, according to what purpose they serve. Um, so you can have an infinite number of projects and transcripts. Uh, and you can have any number of transcripts for a particular project. It could be a project where you have an hour of video and you want to make small different transcripts in different parts rather than do one very, very long transcript. And it could be that uh, you have multiple videos, as you'll see here, we have two videos active. Uh, then you might want to do, because you want to focus on some activity happening somewhere, and then another camera gives you some other activity or uh, actions going on elsewhere. And you can do that. If I open the secondary video window, you'll see we've actually got two video windows of the same video. What I can do is zoom in on one of them, for example, uh, which I'm looking at the same video and I can actually, this is a 360, I can pan around and have a look around. You can see it's a 360 camera and I can decide I wanna see over, over here, this group while I'm watching this group here or all of them. Uh, and uh, don't worry about the, the video cues yet. We can show about that in a moment, but that's what's happening down here. That's allowing you to have a more cinematic experience, decide to automate how you pan and zoom in and what, video, what videos you'll show in this window here or this window here. So you can see if you have a simple 2D camera, a, you know, an ordinary camcorder or a GoPro, then you can decide that you wanna see somewhere else in, or zoom in at the same time as you're looking at this. Uh, for, for example, we wanna see what's on the table over here. So I can just zoom right in and see there's some blocks on the table. You'll see just here, there's some blocks. These blocks are the Lego blocks that they're having to try to, as a game, they're trying to reconstruct from whatever the runner who goes behind a screen is looking at a model that they have to reproduce. So there we see the blocks on the table. Maybe there's a better camera. You see, there's a camera here we could look at. Uh, and there's another camera here. But um, that we'd have to open the, the pro uh, demo, which has all the cameras, all the different footage available. We don't have it available necessarily here in this free demo. Okay, so don't worry about that too much. That's just showing you we can have multiple, two windows open at least, and we can do special things showing the video and deciding which audio we want to listen to, because there could be multiple microphones. The main thing is that we have a transcript window over here. So once we open a new project, it will be blank, and then we can start to fill it out. And this has already been done, so that means we don't have to do too much work here. Up here is what we call the metadata, everything with a double slash. If I add another one here, so I can just say double, uh, double slash, and you can see it goes blue. So that's the metadata. Everything up here is metadata, but I can do that anywhere. For example, I might say here, I noticed something, and I want to add a comment, so I can add a comment here. This is not a typical comment you would find, for example, here in the Jefferson system. This is a technical comment, meaning it's a comment that's outside of the transcript and it will never be included in the export unless I want it to. So I can add written comments and descriptions and annotations here anywhere. Um, okay, so that's, that's a, a basic feature of, of the double slash uh, used specially for, for that purpose. Uh, and then we have uh, R1. R1 is, is, is one of the, is this person here, the researcher with a camera he's walking around with. And that is synced to the video. So if I click that, and then you can see it jumped. I'm at the very beginning up here. If I, if I zoom in and then I will start to play, you'll see that's the very, very beginning. And go back again. I'm at the very beginning of, of the media and I can play. It might not be fluid for you because of the Zoom uh, connection online that uh, some might, might, be, might be slower, but it might be jumpy for you, but it is very, very smooth. And you can see here, we have an idea where we are in the waveform. We also have down here that uh, we're, in, we're doing something with the video cues and you'll see something happen in a moment. If I open up the secondary panel and uh, in fact, I, I, I want to really zoom out a bit here, maybe uh, zoom into just maybe just that group like that a bit more. So that's where we were. So uh, what's gonna happen 
is we get to another sync code, which is here. And if I click that, you'll see we jump there. So what you can do is add on every line that you wish, you can add synchronizations that allow you to jump in the video. See, we're jumping in the video. What's going to happen is she's going to run. And as we hit the video cue here, you'll see that the camera here is going to pan. I'm not using my hands at all. I'm just going to play and you'll see the camera pans to follow her behind the screen. Um, but because we're not in this free version, we don't have another camera, we can't see behind the screen. But what I can do is open up the full version. This is the pro version. Discard that little comment that I made. And what we'll see is uh, as we get to that point, go. she runs and suddenly we have a different camera. This is now a different camera that's on the table here behind the screen that the others can't see. It's this behind this screen here because they're not allowed to see the model, but they have to reconstruct it. So that's the game. You can see that automatically flipped to the new camera. So we can use automation to be able to decide which camera to see, which audio track to listen to, and um, to zoom in or pan within the video. But the sync codes are separate from that. Sync codes are uh, just allow us to jump around and notice everything's put back to where it was. And so we can synchronize uh, the, the, the part of the transcript in a script-based transcription system uh, that's going to be associated with the media at that point. And this is in Danish. It's also got an English translation. And then we have a sub-tier here. You notice this says r1.eng. And .eng is the convention we use for subtitling. Uh, sorry, for, for translations. You could have dot uh, and other languages as well. You can have as many languages as you wish. All you have to do is go to transcript options. And you can see we've added one already, English translation sub-tier automatically for every speaker. We could add another one. So we could have three or four different translations. And we could also have a gloss sub-tier for interlinear gloss. Uh, we don't support a full feature set for that, but we do, you can have a separate gloss line as well that will be treated differently. And we could add that, and that could be called whatever we want. So we can have any number of uh, translations and sub-tiers. Of course, we might have none because it's in English, and we might have one because we're going from one language into English. But there could be a reason why you want to have multiple different translation or gloss sub-tiers. OK, uh, you'll see later about what this action sub-tier is here when we get to the Mondana system. So that is automatic. So for example, let's say I did hear something else here. I did hear P, P2 actually say something here, and I forgot to put it, I can add P. And notice we get auto completion here. It says, oh, what do you want? Do you want to have somebody with a P? Uh, do you want to have an, uh, just a translation tier you missed? Or do you want to have a full? Let's say we heard P2. I can just say I want P2. And notice now, automatically, we have P2, P2.eng, already there, ready for us to start typing. And it, whatever they say, whatever the translation is, we can do that. If we have a new person that we've never seen before, like it's a P4, we won't find that here. But as soon as we do it, let's say P4, and we finish that, then notice it's gone green now. That means if I then do P4 again, uh, or P and P4, it's there ready, and we get the full form. So it learns as it goes along. And every time you add a new person, uh, a new participant, uh, it will automatically fill out the next time. So you don't have to bother remembering the name. You can just say two. Uh, well, P2, and there we get all the ones associated with P2 that could be possible. Could be you do want to have a gloss, and maybe you do want to switch to a Mandara system and have a slash action sub-tier. So it's just giving you the possibilities of auto-completion. That also happens here. For example, auto-completes with a double bracket. If I add a, a, sorry, another one, it auto-completes for a comment here. Uh, it will also uh, uh, do that for, if I do control enter, it says, well, do you want to have something faster than normal? Well, there we are. There's something faster than normal. Uh, do we want to have something uh, with an in-breath? There's with the in-breath starting. Uh, do we want to have something which has a pitch raise? It will give you the right Unicode symbol. And, and have uh, this one here notices with a central dot, not with a full stop or period, because that's often used uh, if the printers will allow it. It's, I've just moved it there. <laughs> if the printers will allow it, uh, then its central dot gives a clearer idea. It's not a it's not a, uh, a full stop terminating intonation. It's actually a, uh, the beginning of an in breath. So you, you've got a, a basic set of auto completions that you can use, uh, and um, you've also got things to do with realignment. So, for example, let's say 
here you added too many spaces so it's a little bit awkward and this little icon comes up here a, a light bulb you can also press control dot and it will say fix and if you say fix it will attempt to fix that so that it's aligned uh, this one's not aligned because it's got an emoji here uh, the emojis are not monospaced, so that means it can't do the alignment properly. If I get rid of that and then I do that again, then it will actually work. There, now it's aligned perfectly. Because emojis, you know, we've used emojis here just to make it more colorful. Emojis are not the same width as all the other characters in this font. So unfortunately, emojis, they look nice, but they, they tend to distort the layout if you're trying to get things nicely aligned. I can go back, so I'm just going back to, to, to where it was. Uh, uh, I added all this stuff here. You see, I'm just undoing everything here. So we can undo uh, uh, pretty much everything. But there, uh, you can't undo adding sync codes, or you can't undo adding uh, the video cues down here, or uh, underlining. Because you can add underlining. If we say you want to underline this, control U as, as normal. Oh, control U. Sorry, I'm pressing Control A there. There, we had the underlining Control U. Um, it's quite dark. I can't see the keyboard very well. So, uh, and if you want to get rid of it, you could just select it again and say Control U, and then it's gone. So standard as you would with a Word document, a word processor for adding underlining. Um, so you can see we've got auto completion. You've got uh, realignments of, of of overlaps to get things as nice and more nicely aligned. Um, which is useful if you're, uh, you've got some overlaps and you realize you've got some something missing and you add that and then it means that it goes out of out of alignment. It's particularly useful with the Mondarin system, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, so let's say you've you've worked on your transcripts, you've been typing. Um, um, you can use the buttons up here to play your media, but you can also use uh, buttons uh, shortcuts to do that using the keyboard. So if you just hover over these, you'll see. Play is control space on Windows. On Mac, it's control N. Uh, if you want to go forward one frame at a time, it's control Alt K, because everything to do with forward movement is a K, and everything to do with reverse movement is the J. So if you look, see a frame back is control Alt J, and that's command option J on Mac. So they're all identical except the play uh, shortcut. Uh, and sync codes, all if you want to add one here, for example, if I just zoom in again, because I had reopened this, and let's say. So that's the end there, and it's going to jump to this. So let's say it's just before that. We actually, we did hear something in here. I mean, it's not true, but let's say we did. I can just click here and add a sync code, and it's automatically synced. All I have to do is right click, and I can delete it. So it's gone. And so there's there's a way for you to query, very quickly uh, add sync codes as you're typing the transcript as it's progressing, or go back and do that one by one. Um, sometimes I do that as I'm going along. You can do that. I just delete that again. Then you can do that with a control M. Control M, it's added on that line, the sync code. If I try to do that, for example, here, you'll see I get an error because there's no way I can add a sync code at that time uh, when it's much later and it's already up to one of these sync codes because that's physically not possible. Uh, every time should be chronologically after the previous one. So it will give you warnings. And if I try to pick this up and drag it over here, uh, let's say I drag it here, drag it, it will say, well, you can't. You can't move this sync code past here because it would be earlier in time, but positioned later in time than it is. So and the same true here. If you try, you can move these as well. Let's say I want to adjust this. Get it just right, and you notice the video is readjusting as I'm moving it. If I move it over here, you'll see I can't. I can't move it over here because I can't move a time code uh, uh, so that it's uh, um, outside of its chronological position. It must be somewhere within these two. Um, otherwise, it's distorting the nature of time. And we're not in a quantum mechanics uh, piece <laughs> of software here. Now, do I hear Jacob laugh? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, maybe we do want to build quantum mechanics. If you want that, ask in the question Q and A. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then once it's all done, then you can go to export, export to RTF, 
And I have a bit of a mess here. You see, that's a, this is a bit of a mess I added here. I'll just leave it there for now. And this is the raw format, but we can say only selected lines. For example, you might only want to export a certain number of lines, not the whole transcript. I can just scroll down. You'll see we've got the whole transcript here. It might be I want a preview because if I have an extremely long transcript of thousands and thousands of lines, it can be slow to render it because every time I make a change here, it will be rendered here. So I could say only when I have 50 lines, we could do that now when I've only got 50 lines. And keep syntax highlighting. You notice the highlighting here. So it's it's got different colors for different features. Keep technical comments. Let's say I do want to have those. We could have those back if we wanted. Uh, line numbering is all, but maybe we want to have a bit more special line numbering, which is only on the first line when somebody is speaking, but not on the translation line and not on comment lines. We could add that if we wished. So we would start to get line numbers on comment lines as well, but we might not want that. So that's you've got different possibilities there. Uh, maybe you don't want to have any lines exported. So let's just leave it as this a bit more sophisticated. You could add, rather than having tabs, because when you type a transcript, you should have the speaker or participant name, a colon, and then a tab, and then no more tabs anywhere else. And then don't know what to do with that. Uh, and then can export it as you wish. Or you can convert all those tabs just to spaces. So it's spaces everywhere, which sometimes publishers would like. And you can change the tab. Notice we could make it a little bit bigger, get it just right. Uh, notice we have this r1.eng, which is a bit, maybe you might think it's a bit ugly. Well, that's where if you have the pro version, you can say, I don't want to have those. And maybe I want to have a bit more subtle formatting where uh, now we have bold for the main speaker tier and then we have the, the translation in italics and, and in, a, in a lighter font, a font color. So now we've got something that looks quite nice and exportable. If I export this and import it in Word, it would look identical to this and uh, be reformatable as you wish. You could, because it's all Korea new font, and you can use consolus font or another monospace font, then you can adjust, provided you don't have uh, convert tabs to spaces. If I turn that off, nothing changes. But as long as there's tabs there, you can reformat that in Word uh, to change the font size, and then everything will fit. If you add the spaces in here, then of course that may make uh, some big difference because uh, it doesn't know um, where the first line should be starting. It just assumes the number of spaces. It may cause a problem, especially if you switch to a non-proportional font like like Helvetica or Al um, Ariel, um, because a publisher might require that. It will really mess up your alignments generally. It's not a good idea. So that's just showing you a bit of nice formatting there. What we could do is just switch to uh, a Mondaren one, just to show you, I'm going to discard those changes. It's a warning. And here we have a bit more sophisticated, uh, um, uh, with only a shorter passage, using a number of, uh, if you know the Mondaren system, it's using a number of sub-tiers, action sub-tiers, uh, to be able to try and track multimodal actions across what we call a neighborhood. In Jeffersonian and Mondadian, we call this a neighborhood, which is a strip of time in which events happen within that time frame. And in this case, you can see here that line uh, 28, R1, says uh, three or so, which is the same as Jefferson. There's a translation. And then we've got things to do with gaze direction and body movement. Um, these, these are saying this starts at the beginning. Uh, uh, it's, it happens before the transcript starts. So, and then after that, it says it continues and it continues on to somewhere else. And so notice that some of these do continued later. It's a whole way of showing uh, timing within the neighborhood and across neighborhoods uh, so that you can say what multimodal actions are happening fairly precisely. Uh, and you can see it can be quite complicated and quite simple. Here, over 0.5 seconds, P3 shifts gaze to the blocks on the table. And I can click that. And we'll see here, does that actually happen? I'm going to play that. You may notice she shifted her gaze down to the blocks on the table. Um, or that was R1, sorry. Uh, we don't have R1 showing here in this one, in this camera view. Uh, um, we probably do in this one here, if I zoom out. There. And this is R1. Sorry, sorry, this is not R. Uh, this is P3. Uh, yeah, this is P3. I was sorry, I was wrong. I was reading R1 as P1. This is P3. She does glance down. But there you notice I just moved around to see what happens. And we could see, does that actually happen? Does P2 actually, sh sh uh, P1 actually shift her gaze as well? And has she already done that? So I go back uh, to this point here. She is looking down already. So 
It must be earlier that she has been looking at the blocks. So we could look back to see P2 gaze, uh, P1 gaze, here's P1 gaze at R1. Um, or maybe she, she's, yeah, I'm forgetting which who is who. We can go back up to the top and see. P1 is this woman, she, she is pregnant. Uh, so uh, at this point, we are concerned with P3, this is P2, and her gaze does shift down. And we could see that maybe if we want to just check and zoom in a bit there. Let's see what she does. There yeah, there's the gaze down, which happens over that 0.2 into 0.3 second. So Mondada is very, can be very precise. It's not as precise as Elan, if you've used Elan, but it's pretty precise uh, in being able to get stuff done. Uh, it's showing multimodal action. There is also uh, backups to backup systems, but we don't really have time to show that unless somebody wants to see that. So we have checkpoints uh, and we have an auto backup system that shows backups that have happened recently, um, if you wish. And then down here, the video cues, as we saw, allow you to switch cameras and switch views. So that's just some of the basics, but I think at, there, at that point I should stop and um, we should have a Q&A for the last 20 minutes. And maybe is there something, Jakob, or Alex, that we could demo that a question's been asked already? It's worth mentioning we also export, uh, export into SRT format as well for subtitling. Yeah, so here you have subtitling. Uh, SRT files are simple plain text files that you can play along. If you put them with the same name in, a, in the same folder as your media file on Mac or Windows, you can just play those. And most good players will show you subtitles and you can actually format them with color or background or move them around if you've got a reasonably good media player. Uh, and then you can hard burn them in as hard coded into the media as well. There are, you know, subtitle edit is very good uh, on Windows for that. So here you see, here's, this is the subtitles and it's and it can you can decide which language. We want to have the English only or I want to see the original as well. So you can decide, I want to see both the, the original language and the translation. I also want to have uh, uh, intervals of timing. So here we see the micro pausing and longer intervals down here, and also speaker names. Now speaker names have been added. So you get a few choices there in subtitles. There is one question in the chat. Uh, maybe that's uh, best that you answer that, uh, whether there's any, minimum requirements for Mac OS and Windows, Alex? Sure, I was starting to type it, but I can just say it instead. <laughs> yeah. uh, I haven't come across any limitations. I've got it running on an old Windows machine from 14 years ago, no problem. And I have an old Mac Air from the earlier uh, Intel CPU days, and it runs fine on that too. So I, I haven't come across a limitation yet. Um, yeah, if you... and I, I've used it on uh, Windows 10 on a on a Surface tablet, an old Surface tablet, and could play the exact same files here that we're seeing switching between video. The key thing is that you have an SSD drive, if you can, to store the data. Uh, and Primarily, so if, you're... if you're working with multiple videos at the same time, and particularly if you're doing 4K, 360 files, anything that's very large bit rates. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I understand uh, the next question. Uh, if if Can George has it? a hard yes, of course, Katrina. Yeah, Hi. Um, it's just uh, um, all programs have their limitations, and I was just wondering what what limitations do you find in the program? Does it have a specifically hard time in some situations or something like that? Um, no, it's unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I suppose one is if you're going to use checkpoints, uh, it requires you to install Git onto your computer in advance, um, which is not hard to do. And there's tutorials online to explain that. But uh, we haven't built in that checkpoint mechanism into our program yet. We rely on third party Git systems that are available for free for Mac and Windows to handle that for us. Uh, and sometimes that can be sluggish. Um, so that's not something we can control. It's just how fast Git runs on your machine. So I suppose that's a limitation. Yeah. And and, and I think uh, I, I, that is another thing that is worth mentioning is it's not a limitation of Dote, but more on general on media players that uh, we have been uh, asked quite a few times, whether, wh why can I not play my media files in Dote? Mm. And that is simply because they are recorded in a... Uh, in a 
proprietary uh, uh, format or, or have a different codec, it could be, for instance, uh, MTS files. And no matter what, uh, also Elaine uh, and other transcription software will, will not be able to play that. So you need to uh, trans transcode your video into something that can be played inside Dote. And that will be the same for all other uh, types of transcription software. Uh, that, also, that, yeah, so, sorry. Alex. A, that also goes for all your HEVC or H.265 files that mm. often come off of GoPro and things. Um, those are very high bitrate files and they've compressed them to a newer format to get them to fit on an SD card. And no web browser supports that, and ours certainly doesn't either. Uh, those you'll have to transcode yourself before using an any transcription program, really. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Mang text. You're welcome. Um, and another thing, uh, you might experience that Dote uh, will not create a, a waveform at the first time, but we have uh, made it really easy for you. So if you go to File and then Settings, then you can. Uh, uh, install and link uh, FFmpeg and FFprobe uh, by just clicking one button and then uh, it will work straight out of the box afterwards and forever. So that's really a nice, uh, neat feature where where you will never have experience uh, problems creating waveforms again. To well, explain on that, yeah. Dote supports MP4 and H.264 natively internally, but sometimes you have some older formats from like Sony cameras back in the day and such. Uh, those require the third-party program to help try to make that waveform out of that's what that extra button is for. Um, so more of legacy files. Thank you. Yeah, it turns out video files, there can be endless number of different ways that it's been stored uh, and how it needs to be unencoded to be able to play. So there are limitations there. It's also not true... Jakob, that uh, it will last forever because if there's a new version, oh, yeah, a new okay. release of Dote, <laughs> then you will have to redo it. Um, okay. But but uh, anyway, it will work for as long as the life of that release, and then you just yeah. have to re-download it to, to fit with the new version that uh, you download and install. But we, have, we haven't had to do for months a, a an update. There's no hot fixes for Dote because it's working perfectly. So, uh, But we will be coming out with new features uh, uh, over time. Uh, and in, in finding any bugs, there are one or two bugs that we found which are not essential, but uh, we will be we will be fixing and uh, putting in a new release. But you can see here, this is the Dote settings, which is where you can say how often you want your auto backups, what sort of do you, standard you want in your transcripts for the editor font size. You can you can tailor it in each transcript. You can tailor also the width of the name column, which is the distance for the speaker or the participant. Also, the number of characters in a in a page width, meaning you can see here there's a margin here. You can have a margin at any any distance you would like. That's just because uh, once you go over about 65, 70, 75 characters, then it's a danger that in a, in a in a, a publication uh, that you'll you'll be word wrapping or going over the margin that the publisher requ requires. So it giving you could just set that yourself. And then you can also decide the standard defaults for, for trans conventions or projections of different types. And then you can do that for the symbols that are available for Mondada, the different alignment symbols, if you know that system. You can also reassign the shortcuts if you don't like our shortcuts. We've tried to design them so they're really easy to use while you're typing and editing. Your transcript, you can also be playing back because they are very, very nice, uh, friendly. They're not heavy on the one hand. Uh, so you, if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, which I have, then you can actually reassign these to anything you want. Um, so that's giving you some idea of the overall settings. And then the transcript options are the things you can set for this particular transcript. But the checkpoints, just to show that, because we never really had time to say that, here you see, uh, if I just go back, this is uh, uh, the Jefferson, but with errors, there are errors here. Now just notice there's errors, which is our heuristics. We will find errors in your transcript or warnings and then give you an idea what's what's what the problem might be. Notice here it's saying, maybe you've got a closing bracket missing here. And this one here says um, there's something missing from this line. Um, so so you, you, know, you, need to, you need to work on that uh, because it could be something quite serious. And it will give you some clue about what that is, a range of different possible errors. Uh, 
And then what I did to make this is I took the, 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 the good version and then I corrupted it by adding. And here I can see nine months ago, I did that. Three months ago, I did a little change. And so I can go back and see the changes I made because I was making messages for the changes that I made. So for example, uh, tab instead of spaces in the body of the transcript. So if I click on that one, that will show me here. And you can see it's at this point here that I changed this from spaces to a tab uh, and then realigned things. But we're not allowed to have tabs inside here because that makes it quite difficult to, to reformat and do alignments correctly. So that was something I added. I could look at another one, a misaligned overlap. So I could click that one. That was the message that I put in when I made that change and it's showing me there. Notice here I added some spaces. I'm sorry, I deleted some spaces. So that's now not aligned with the other one. Just a simple thing. There's a deliberate error that was introduced. Uh, and with the pro version, you can see these type of showing you the different, what's changed, what was deleted, what was added, and it will give you that. Uh, and just to show you how that might work, I, I, can, I can leave peak mode. I'm peaking here at something in the past, some, some changes I made. Uh, I can go back and for example, let's just say here, I could add, let's say there is another speaker, um, P1, and they say something here. Now I've added that. Uh, let's just put the translation, whatever it might be. Um, now, if I go to checkpoints, it will say you've made a change and it shows you what the change is. And I could give that a name, you know, mess up transcript. So I've messed it up just to show you a, a comment. I can add that. And now a few seconds ago, it says, hey, you already did that. That's the work that you've done. The change is made since the previous one, three months ago. So you can keep adding small changes that you make. It's a whole new way maybe for many of you to think about uh, keeping uh, track of what things you've done to your transcript because it's very easy to go back to a transcript and uh, even the day before and, and just forget what did I actually change here uh, and then keeping multiple different document versions in Word for example is, is getting a bit crazy but this does it all for you you don't even have to worry where it's stored and how it's doing it and I can go back in time uh, some of the transcripts I have they, they would have hundreds and hundreds of, of comments about changes I've made and they can also be what other people have made. I can share, for example, if I go out of this, and go back, I can uh, import and export. I can export the whole project and then decide what things to include and which transcripts to include, export it as a file and send it to somebody and they can import it with even all the media ready to play. And I can do that just for a transcript, for example. I can export a transcript to a file. And it says, well, what do you want to include in that? And if you include the checkpoint history, and it's somebody has sent you, for example, a student has sent you, or you as a student send to your supervisor a transcript, they can add comments and correct it and put comments in the checkpoints such that you can see every single change that was made with some commentary. Uh, and then they can send that back to you and you can open it in your project as a new transcript and then uh, look at the changes that have been made and decide, oh yeah, that's true, I will change that or that one I don't agree with. So this means it's good for sharing transcripts, for getting feedback on transcripts. Where we use it with students. Uh, so um, okay, I'm just looking. I thought it said, "What is Paul talking about?" <laughs> but it's what Paul is talking about now. Um, so yeah, I guess that's answering Maria's question about collaboration. Um, we are working on new software right now, which will sit above DOT and all the projects and transcripts you create and then allow all sorts of annotations and ways of working and collecting across multiple projects and transcripts. Um, and that will be included in the pro version most likely. Um, so that's another piece of software that will just, wherever your projects and transcripts are that you've created, no matter what they are, they could be clips from all over the place, totally different settings, then you'll be able to find patterns and make collections. And so that will also be something that you can do collaboratively as well. So hopefully that's given you an idea. There's also the auto backups because that's just done, notice here three minutes ago, it made some backups when I had made some disruption to the, to the, to the uh, transcript. Um, so I could go back and look at those. You can see it. Uh, I made some changes. That's being done every five minutes. Whenever I make a change, it says, okay, five minutes has passed. I'll just save that for you in case you wish to go back because sometimes it could be get corrupted. We've never had really any transcript be corrupted um, yet, but uh, for example, that could happen or 
It could be that you made some changes and you realize you don't want those and you want to go back and you hadn't made any checkpoints. So, okay, uh, is there anything else to, to demo? Uh, not really. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead. Or things that you want us to demonstrate. We still have a few minutes left. Importing media. I don't know. Well, that's the media manager. So when you make a new project, if I just do that, you'll see. If I say new project, let's just call it test, main, and put it here, Jeffersonian. Say create. There we are. We've got a new blank project. If I go to media manager, there's no media there. Add a file and go to the Lego demo project, and we have the files there. I could say, well, I actually want one of those. They could be anywhere. And what Dope will do is make a copy of it and put it in the project folder that you've created so that you, you'll have your original media somewhere else. And you, so we don't want to move that into, into a dope project because you might actually use it for other purposes as well. So let's say, for example, we want to have this Insta360 here. I could just say, yes, it's copying it. Notice it's 290 megabytes, it's quite large. It's done, it's active, it's ready to go. It's a 360, a dope projection, for example. And uh, if I then close this, what you'll see is we see the video, and in a second, we should see a uh, waveform being generated here. There it goes, it's creating the waveform for us automatically. And meanwhile, I can, I can zoom in and I can start transcribing while it's doing that. Then we could start off R1, for example. Notice it's all blank and whatever they say to get started. I need a translation sub-tier but uh, I can just do that straight off now because I know what R1 is and there we get the translation. Could be I want to have um, a gloss. So R1, let's add a gloss. And then we have, you know, is it a pronoun? Or what sort of, uh, is it first person, singular? Whatever system I've used in a, into the Mia gloss system, you could do and match it uh, to the, um, the uh, uh, main uh, part or the translation, usually to the main line, the main original language, of course, is what you want to do the gloss to, and then continue on from there. So I've got my media. If I've got others, I just add those, and I could have as many as I have recorded. Maybe it's only one camera, and we're good to go. Uh, if not, you can add the other ones. So it's nice and nice and quick to add media. It just might take a little bit of time to make the waveform, depending on the size of the file. You can see this one took about five seconds for three minutes, 43 seconds, but it is quite a big file because it's a 364K camera. And we're all ready to go. Uh, there's no checkpoints yet, but you see I've made some changes. It says, oh, what those changes are. So I could make a checkpoint, you know, started transcription and uh, just say yes. And there we have our first checkpoint, started transcription, showing us what it is. Auto backup. Well, it's got some auto backups uh, a few seconds ago, two minutes ago when it was created. So showing the first one would be nothing there. And then the second one, five minutes after five minutes is this one. Uh, well, it's actually two minutes um, because a change was made. And uh, in terms of options, the options are the default. There is no translation tier yet. It means that it won't be completed automatically. I could add that. And let's say I want to have the automatic gloss and just say add and add, it's done. And now when I say R1 complete, I get all three of those at once. So you can see there, I very, very quickly started a transcript. Okay, so maybe to finish, we'll go to Fabiola's, uh, uh, the Mondad and transcription, distinguishing lines of terms of talk and lines of multimodal transcription. Yeah, that's, we can show that. I go to the Mondad and version here. Then don't, does it just precisely as um, Lorenzo Mondada's conventions 5.0.1, that's the latest one will do. And here, this is the uh, neighborhood here, one neighborhood. This is another neighborhood. And the neighborhood involves either speech, primary speaker, or in this neighborhood, timed intervals. 
and no speech. So everything hangs off that. And all these symbols here, you notice uh, this says this continues to this point. Let's say I mess that up and I mess this one up and I mess this one up and then I also mess this one up. They're all out of sync now. They're, they're all timed to this line here. They're all out of sync. Uh, what I can do is just, if I click in here and I say realign, it fixes them all. So it will fix any number of sub tiers. So they're all nicely realigned um, so that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, and don't recognize this as the primary speaker in the neighborhood and everything else is hanging off that. So for Fabiola, hopefully that makes sense in terms of um, how DOTE treats a Mondaden um, system in terms of the primary tier. It recognizes this is the primary tier, this is the primary uh, element of the tier, et cetera, all the way down. And those symbols are defined in your transcript options, so you can't accidentally use the wrong symbol in the wrong line. Yeah, so you can see they're all defined here. Here are all of the uh, speaker or participants' names, and here's the tier and the symbol associated with that tier. So when I'm on this tier, for example, what's the symbol? If I say control enter, it says, okay, you probably want this symbol here. And when I'm up in this tier, or uh, for example, if I say control enter, it says, well, you've got a lot of possibilities. It could be any one of these sub tiers. So it knows that these sub tiers are associated with this, the head of the neighborhood. So uh, it's it's being pretty smart to, 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 to give you help but of course, if you make mistakes, it will warn you. For example, here, if I delete something, you notice now it's giving a lot of warnings because I've deleted something that doesn't make sense. This isn't, hasn't got any symbol to align onto the, prime, the head of the, the neighborhood. So now it's giving you a bunch of errors. So uh, undo that and it's right. So think everything's fine now. Everything's nicely coordinated. It finds about over 20 different errors in, in this system, which are very common errors. Okay, so I think we've come to the end. Yeah, and people are also starting to leave. Uh, it's three o'clock. Yeah, so we say thanks for everybody for yeah. attending. Do you and, want to mention um, the survey? Um, I think the no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, we could say there is a survey, and uh, maybe we could send it. Can you send to a list of the people who are registered for the? Yes, workshop? I can do that. Yeah, yes. yeah. So there's a survey about how people use transcription software and how they do transcription generally and trying to find out how people actually do it and uh, what are the best ways of doing it such that we can better support that. So uh, if you have time, please fill out that questionnaire online. It's anonymous. Yes. But uh, thank you for attending and uh, don't up your life. <laughs>